Kyle Johnson is here to talk about Inception and philosophy. He's the editor of the book. Among He's also the uh, frequent contributor to other uh, volumes of the uh, Blackwell Philosophy and Popular Culture series, including Heroes in Philosophy. Um, and he's here to talk today about uh, Inception and why, what's the premise of the... Uh, it should have won Best Picture. Why, why Inception should have won Best Picture. Uh, it's, it's a very cogently uh, argued uh, philosophical argument, which I think you all will enjoy. And without further ado, uh, let's welcome Kyle to Google. Uh, thank you very much, Tyler. Um, so just to make sure who's seen Inception. Good. All right. Because uh, if you haven't seen it, you almost can't spoil Inception because it's unclear what's going on in Inception, right? So there's like no ending to spoil necessarily. Um, but what I do want to argue today uh, is that Inception should have won Best Picture, all right? Uh, and I should warn you that there's going to be a lot of stuff flying at you here. The words on the slides are really for my benefit. The pictures are for your benefit, so don't feel like you need to read everything. The PowerPoint's designed such that you could just go through the PowerPoint by yourself and understand it. Uh, so don't be overwhelmed by, by some text-heavy uh, uh, slides, as it were. But I'm going to... Um, argue that Inception should have won Best Picture. Now, I really don't actually care that much about whether or not it won Best Picture, like I wasn't crying the night the Oscars were on whenever it didn't win. Uh, but the reason I think it didn't won, excuse me, that it didn't win is because the Academy didn't understand it. I think it went right over their heads. Um, and so what I'm really attempting to do here is I'm attempting to explain, like by telling you why it should have won, I'm going to explain the movie. I'm going to help you understand the movie about what it was about, about even what happened in it, like what the plot is at, what actually is going on in the plot. And I'm going to show you how philosophy can help you understand the movie. And I think maybe you can't even really truly understand the movie without it. And so that's a lot of what the book tries to do is help you use philosophy to understand Inception, and then once you understand it, we go off and we explore other philosophical issues that are raised by the movie. So, some things that they may have missed. One thing that the Academy probably missed about Inception was that the movie itself is an analogy, it's an allegory for movie making. That the dream team, each element of the dream team, has an analogous element to those who make a movie, right? So Cobb, who orchestrates everything, he's the director. Ariadne, who designs the dreams, she's the screenwriter, right? Sato, who bankrolls the whole thing, who buys the whole airline instead of just buying out first class, right? He's the production company, he's the bankroll, right? Uh, Arthur, who organizes everything, he's the producer. Eames, who puts on characters, literally portrays the sexy blonde or Browning, the godfather, he's the actor. Yusuf, who has the technical savvy to it, chemically concoct the chemical they use to put themselves under that make the whole thing possible, he's special effects. Fisher, the mark, he's the audience, right? And we even see things like this where we see Eames as Browning, but you see, you see Eames in the mirror there, he's actually sitting at an old time vanity mirror like an actor would. Right? And so we have this direct analogy with movie making itself where Inception is actually an analogy for movie making itself. Here's something else that they probably missed. I believe it was uh, Hans Zimmer who did the music for Inception has, has admitted in, in, uh, 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 in interviews that it's not just the intro. 
every piece of music all the way throughout the film is based on different parts of that Edith Piaf track, either sped up or slowed down to different tempos. And he just took those elements, took it, sped it up, slowed it down, and then composed the music for the film based on that, right? That is cool. That is really cool, and that's something that most people missed about the film, right? And in fact, Inception in self is an Inception, right? You may think that Inception is impossible. In fact, they even talk about that in the movie, that it's impossible to get into someone's mind and implant an idea in there and make them think that it was their own idea. But that's just what movies do. That's all movies do. Is that's all they do. But that's one big thing that they do is they incept ideas into us, right? Inception probably incepted into you the, the idea that reality may not be actually real, but instead is a dream, right? Inception happens all the time. That's the whole point of advertising is inception, right? And so, but these are not even, this is just, this is Padre Jeff. This is just little tiny things that you may have missed. This is not even the big stuff, all right? Kind of cool, but not the big stuff. Here's the big stuff, or at least starting with the big stuff, just, just getting started. On the surface, the movie's a great action film with some cool special effects and kind of a clever cliffhanger, right? Uh, you know, at the end, and then he spins the top to see if he's really in reality, and they, and they fade, to the, they, go to the, they go to the top, is it gonna fall, and they cut out, and you don't know, right? Like, that's, that's kind of cool, right? Um, unraveling the movie would seem to simply require discovering the answer to the question, did the top fall? And if you knew whether the top fell or not, then you'd know whether Cobb was home, and the movie would kind of be nicely wrapped up, right? The first step to understanding Inception is realizing that the answer to that question, did the top fall, doesn't matter at all. Even if we knew whether or not the top fell, we would still not understand the movie. Even if the top falls, Cobb could still be dreaming. And in fact, I think he probably is. And I'm gonna give you an argument for why. All right, so first, we have to start out asking ourselves, how do totems work? Because Cobb's top is not the only totem in the movie, right? Arthur's got a totem, it's the die, right? Uh, Bishop, uh, the, uh, Ariadne's got a to totem, it's the bishop. There's some others as well. You're never supposed to let anyone else see how your totem works. So don't let anyone else be able to touch your totem, right? Because if they do, they might feel how it's weighted in the real world, and then your totem will not be able to tell you whether or not you're in one of their dreams, right? So for example, Arthur's totem is the loaded die, right? If Ariadne touched his totem, she might get an inkling about how it's weighted in the real world. And she would know that whenever he rolls it in the real world, it always comes up a five, right? So he can't let her touch that because if she touches that, then if he's in one of her dreams and he rolls his die in her dream, well, she knows it's supposed to come up a five. And so she would dream that it would come up a five. So you can't let anyone know how your totem behaves in the real world, right? If she does touch it, then it will not be able to tell Arthur whether or not he is in her dream. And this is why he doesn't let her touch it, right? This is also why Ariadne refuses to let Cobb touch her totem, the bishop, right? If he gets an inkling as to how it works, then how it's weighted in the real world and how it falls, then it won't be able to tell her whether or not he's in one of his dreams, right? So since, but here's the thing, most importantly, what this means is that totems can only tell you that you're not in someone else's dream, right? Arthur even says, specifically says that in the film. It can, not, it can only tell you if you're not in someone else's dream. It can't tell you whether or not you're in your own dream. So even if the top falls at the end, Cobb could still be dreaming because he could still be in his own dream because he knows how his totem works. So even if it falls, he could still be in his own dream. But it gets worse. Cobb reveals too much, right? When Ariadne calls totems an elegant solution for keeping track of reality, this is right after he had asked to see hers and she said, no, you can't see. He's like, oh, good job. You shouldn't let anyone know how your totem works. Right after that, she says, it's an elegant solution for keeping track of reality and ask if it was his idea. And he says, no, it was Maul's actually. This one was hers. She would spin it in the dream and it would never topple, just spin and spin. He just did what he told her never to do, tell people how your totem works. He just told her how it works. So now the totem's no good for telling him whether or not he's in one of her dreams, right? Because now she knows how it works. And since she designed all the dreams of the Inception, it can't tell him whether or not he's out of the Inception or not because the tops would fall. She knows how it works in all the dreams in the Inception. And worse yet, the top was originally Maul's. That was her totem, it's not his. She knows how it works. So it can't tell him whether or not he's in her dream either. 
So even if the top falls at the end, he could still be in his own dream, he could still be in Ariadne's dream, he could still be in Maul's dream. Now, he thinks Maul is dead, of course, so he doesn't have to, think he has to worry about that, right? But the problem, of course, is she might have been right. And if she was, she's still alive. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But it gets even worse. Those three people that it could be that, 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 that he's still dreaming in, that he's in their dream. But it gets worse. Think about how the other totems work, right? Arthur only knows what number his die falls on in the real world. Only Ariadne knows how her bishop is weighted in the real world. There's another totem, Eames totem, the poker chip. It's not exactly stated in the film, but you can kind of tell because he's always playing with it. That's his totem. And it's not quite clear how it works, but if you think about it, you can figure it out. There's one line in the film where Cobb talks about the misspelling on his chip. And if you went to Comic-Con this year, one of my uh, contributors, Lance, uh, showed me this picture. This is from Comic-Con this year. They had Eames Totem on display. And if you look, it says Mombasa District uh, Casino 100 shillings. It's a, it's a Mombasa Casino uh, a casino chip, right? But it's misspelled. There's an extra S in Mombasa. And this is how his totem works. If he looks at his, if he looks at his poker chip and he sees that extra S, he knows he's in the real world because he put it there. But if he looks at his po poker chip and it's spelled correctly, it doesn't have that extra S, then he knows that he's in someone else's dream, right? But with each one of these totems, notice that their behavior in the real world is unique. It's loaded, it's weighted, it has an extra S. In the dream, it behaves ordinarily. Roll the die and it rolls random, right? But Cobb's totem is backwards. How does it behave in the real world? Like all tops behave in the real world, it falls down. Its behavior in the dream is unique. All the other totems, how they behave in the real world is unique and in the dream is ordinary. His is ordinary in the real world, unique in a dream, it's backwards. And since not only do Maul and, and Cobb obviously and Ariadne know that his top would fall in the real world, we know his top would fall in the real world. That's what tops do, right? Everybody knows that top. if Cobb was in one of your dreams and he spun his top, what would you dream that it would do? Well, I dream that it was fall, would fall because that's how I think they behave in the real world, right? Cobb, even if the top falls at the end, he could still be in anyone's dream. The top falling at the end tells us nothing. It is a red herring. It is there to distract you to think you've got it figured out. Oh, if I only knew if the top fell, I'd have it all figured out. No, you wouldn't. And this is not a mistake. This is not an oversight. This is intentional. Cobb himself is shown as, un as an unreliable source of information in the film. You notice how much time Cobb spends doing the things he never says to do. Is actually a line from Arthur in the movie, right? We see that, we actually see two versions of some of, of some of the events, of some of the events in the film that he recounts. Like whenever he is, uh, when he and Maul are laying on the train track in limbo, the first time we see it, they're young. And then later when we see it again, they're old. Well, which is it? Cobb tells us himself that he tries to alter his memories. What is he saying? Is, is, is any of it accurate at all? Is that really how totems work? We don't know. That's what's, the, that's the beauty of it, right? That ending was much more clever than you thought. Much more clever than you thought. What's clever is the magic trick that Nolan pulls on us, all right? Nolan has misdirected you, trying to make you pay attention to the wrong thing, the top, to try to find out whether Cobb is still dreaming. So what you're doing at the end of the film is like, oh, I wonder if he's still dreaming. And so you're looking down here at the top. Will it fall, will it fall, will it fall? While you're looking, What's actually going, the clue is up here on the upper right. You need to be watching and listening to those children whenever they first meet Cobb after he's back home. You need to be listening. That's where the clue is. But you didn't hear it because you were looking at this. <laughs> Cobb has misdirected you. Now, to tell you, the, the children say something here that's very illuminating. But to understand why it's illuminating, I need to give you a little background. And the background is this. We see in the movie that the subconscious works its way through dreams. The most obvious example is the train in limbo, right? The train from limbo barreling down Yusuf's kidnap dream in the middle of that city street, right? The subconscious element, part of Cobb's, Cobb's subconscious that's working its way through a dream. This is not the only example. 
two really good examples. That random string of number that Fisher's arbitrarily gives as the combination to his father's safe, right? They're, they're in the, the kidnapped dream. He's like, no, tell me the first, five, you know, the first six, uh, six numbers that come right to your head right now. And he says, uh, I don't know, 528491, right? Well, you have to do better than that. And they, they haul him off. Well, that 528491 starts showing up in the dream after that again and again and again. It's the combination of both safes in Eames Snow Fortress dream. It's the fake telephone number that Eames gives as the sexy blonde, and it's also in Arthur's hotel dream. In addition, Maul and Cobb's anniversary suite number, where she jumps from the window, is, five, is 3502. That number is also on the train that barrels down through the middle of the street, and the taxi they hail in that dream is 502, excuse me, 2053. It's that same number backwards. So, there's the napkin, 528491. That's the phone number that the sexy blonde gives Fisher. There's the hotel room numbers in Arthur's hotel room dream, 528 and 491. And then if you were to look at uh, Eames, or excuse me, uh, um, uh, Fisher put in the uh, combination for the safe, you see there 528491 for the safe that is in the snow fortress. Uh, it's hard to see here because the picture isn't very good, but you'd see 3502 here on the door, especially if you have it in Blu-ray, you can see the 3502 there. You can see the 3502 on the train there as it barrels down through the middle of the city street, and then the uh, 2053 on the taxi that they hailed in that same dream. Subconscious elements work their way through. Well, another subconscious element has worked its way through, all right? Both at the beginning and ending of the film, we see that Sato dreams of a mansion on an ocean, a house, as is described in the script, a house on a cliff. When Cobb returns to his children at the end of the film and asks them what they have been doing, they say they are building a house on a cliff. Turn the captions on and you'll see it right there in black and white. It looks like a subconscious element of Sado, Sado subconscious, it's working its way through into the dream that is at the end of the film. It's working its way through and picking out that subconscious, right? Now, why think that Cobb is in Sado's dream specifically, not his own dream or, or someone else's dream? Well, here's the thing. Think about where, if, if you exit limbo, if you commit suicide in limbo, where do you go? Well, we only actually have two examples in the film of where you go when you exit limbo, and that's Ariadne and Fisher. At the end of the film, they go down there to find Fisher. She kicks him off the building. He falls and he wakes up. And then a little bit later, she throws herself off, and she falls and she wakes up. But where do they go? Back to the real world? No. They go one layer up. They go to the Snow Fortress stream, Eames Snow Fortress stream. They go one layer up. And then he, you know, uh, Fisher finishes uh, the inception there. And then when, when, when Ariadne gets back, they ride the kicks back up the layers, right? But you only go one layer up when you exit limbo. Not back to the real world. Not all the way back to the one layer up. That's it, right? So at the end of the film, when you can barely see the picture there, but at the end of the film, whenever Sato, when Cobb finds Sato in limbo and he's got his gun, if he were to shoot himself in the head, where would he go? Well, wouldn't he go where everyone else goes when they exit limbo? One layer up? And that would be the Eames Snow Fortress dream. But everyone's already left that dream layer. So he would find it empty, ready for the taking. He would fill it with his own expectations, his own assumptions, his own subconscious, and that would be to find himself on the plane after the inception was complete. Once Cobb shoots himself after that, he would pop up to that same level, find Sato's airplane dream, and he would go back to his kids in that airplane dream. And notice that they could be there for 10 years, right? The way dreams work before they finally realized that they were still dreaming, right? So it's entirely possible, based on a consistent interpretation of the film, that Cobb was still dreaming, even if the top fell. He would still be dreaming, he'd be in Sato's dream, as a dream that he created once he got to Eames Snow Fortress, dream layer that was empty, once he woke up from limbo, only going one layer up. So Inception's more complicated than you think. What's clever about the ending is not the fact that it's a clever cliffhanger. It's clever because it tricked you into thinking it was a clever cliffhanger. When it, was a cli when it wasn't a cliffhanger at all, you should have already suspected that he was still dreaming and realized that the top was a red herring. That's what's clever about it. Nolan misdirected it. At first you were confused. Then you thought you had it figured out. But then you start to think about it and everything you thought you figured out, you're not confused about and you actually misunderstood. 
right? That's what's beautiful about it. it. It lends itself to multiple interpretations. Are we convinced that it was better than the king's speech yet? <laughs> Come on, right? But we have only scratched the surface. If we think about Sado and where you go when you exit limbo, right? If when you exit limbo, you just go one layer up like Ariadne and Fisher did, then where did Maul and Cobb go when they exited limbo? When they put their head on the train tracks and they exited limbo? Wouldn't they have done what everybody else does? Go one layer up? Well, what would be on that layer? Would that be the real world? Well, Cobb actually tells Ariadne, whenever he's recounting the events that preceded their, uh, you know, they, that preceded their meeting, that they entered limbo after experimenting with, let me get the quote exactly right here, after exploring the concept of a dream within a dream. They were doing multi-level level dreaming, and he pushed them too far. He went too deep, and they landed in limbo. But that means that they entered limbo after going through a multi-level dream, so when they woke up from limbo, where would they have gone? Wouldn't they have just gone one layer up of that multi-level dream? We see them awake on, awake on this apartment floor hooked up to a passive device, but is that the real world? Or wouldn't that just be the lowest lever of the multi-level dream they used to get into limbo in the first place? The real world in which the whole plot of the movie takes place could actually be a dream. Maybe the whole movie is a dream from beginning, from beginning to end. Forget about the end. The whole movie looks like it may be a dream. And in fact, Nolan leaves, uh, leaves us many clues that suggest exactly this. So if you look at the Mombasa chase scene that's supposed to happen in the real world, it has very many dreamlike elements. The overhead shots establish that Mombasa is like a maze. The agents that are after him literally pop in and out of nowhere inexplicably. And the walls of buildings literally close in around him just like they do in dreams, right? So we see that Mombasa is like a maze. We see COBOL agents that come out of nowhere. It's kind of a blurry pic, but if you look at when he's in the cafe and he kind of gets called out and he starts to run, literally for out of nowhere, there's an agent that comes and tackles him from the right. There's no way that he was just like, he was just there, right? Literally appearing out of nowhere, just like they do in dreams, right? And the walls close in around him. They look like they're fine here. And as I try to go through, they get squeezes and squeezes and the walls literally are closing in around me, right? Just like they do in dreams. Eames, clue number two, Eames is a dream forger, but it looks like he forges in reality. Eames is a dream forger, appearing as others in dreams and magically lifting Fisher's wallet in Arthur's hotel room dream as the sexy blonde. If you look closely, whenever he's lifting, uh, the, uh, when he's lifting his, uh, his, uh, his wallet in the hotel room dream, he doesn't actually touch him. He doesn't actually get anywhere close to him. He just has the wallet. He just appears, right? Which is fine. He's dreaming. He can do that. He's a dream forger. He can just forge the wallet, right? Yet in the real world, Eames forges casino chips and he lifts Fisher's wallet, excuse me, his passport in the airplane in exactly the same way. So Eames picks pockets in the real world just like he does in a dream without even touching you. Watch the scene and you'll see he can't even come close. It's like Eames is there, they're sort of close, and then poof, he has, he has the passport inexplicably, right? Eames bets his last two chips in the real world and the script, the script calls him his last two chips. And he's broke, he even says, you've got to buy, we're going to go for a beer, you've got to buy. And then he goes to the cashier and just magically, poof, there's chips, he cashes them in. He's literally dream forging right there in the real world. The, 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 the script even describes that he mysteriously produces two stacks of chips that he then cashes in. Clue number three, mall suicide. Consider, you can't see it here. Consider where mall sits during her suicide attempt. She supposedly, what supposedly happened was she trashed the, their hotel suite, right? And then climbed out on the ledge. But if she did that, she would be on the same side of the building as their room, right? He would be able to look out the window and look and she would be out there on, her si on their side of the building. That's not where she's at. She's in the window of another hotel room across the way. And it is another hotel room. If you look behind her, you'll see the same things that are behind top. It's another hotel in the window of another hotel room. That doesn't make any sense. How did she get over there? Right? And in fact, it is like Cobb doesn't even realize it doesn't make sense. He's asking her, please come back in, come back in, come back, as she can just walk across that gap. Right? It doesn't make any sense. That's exactly the kind of thing that you watch and you don't really think about it, but then you think about it a little bit more. Yeah, that doesn't make much sense. Just like in a dream. 
right? Weird things happen in dreams, and they seem perfectly normal. But then when you wake up, you go, yeah, that didn't make much sense. How did I not know that I wasn't dreaming? How did I not know that I was dreaming? How do you not know that he wasn't dreaming right there? He's got to be. His father-in-law, Miles, even tells him to come back to reality at one point. And this is my favorite clue. The song the dreamers use to herald the end of the movie is that Edith P.S. song that we listened to before, right? It means, no, I regret nothing in English. This, when the song is done, the dream is over. That's what heralds into the dream. Song is done, dream is over. The running time of the original recording of that song that they use in the film is 2 minutes and 28 seconds. Inception is to the second, 2 hours and 28 minutes long. Exactly. Watch your Blu-ray player. Watch it click down. Exactly 2 hours and 28 minutes long. Could it be, just like with shared dreaming, when the movie is done, when the song is done, the dream is over? Right? The entire movie, I think, is a dream. Now, the thing is, you can't, like, no, there's, there's always two signs to every coin, right? No clue is going to settle this one way or the other. And there are clues that suggest that the real world is indeed real, right? Um, this is kind of a good Nolan. Anybody know where this is from? It's a Batman reference because Nolan does Batman too. Uh, but there's two sides to every coin. Let's look at a couple of clues that the real world may actually be real. So, for example, if you look at Cobb's kids, whenever he's kind of flashing back, they're younger, and at the end, they're actually wearing slightly different clothes and they're older. And they're actually played by different actors and actresses, right? Uh, two, different, uh, two different actors there. So some have su suggested that that means that they really did age and he's back in the real world. Others have suggested that Cobb's totem is not really the, the top, it's his wedding ring. And that whenever he's in the real world, he doesn't wear the wedding ring except in flashbacks. And then when he's dreaming, he's still wearing the wedding ring. Right? And this includes the end of the movie. If you look at the end of the movie, whenever he's checking in with, his, uh, uh, with the ISA agent, he doesn't, he's not wearing his wedding ring. Right? So that could indicate that the, the end of the movie is also real. Right? But the truth is, pointing to the movie and clues in the movie is never going to settle anything. Right? The movie is ambiguous, and Nolan himself has admitted that he intentionally made it ambiguous. It's supposed to be open to interpretation. Nothing will definitively prove anything one way or the other. The dream clues could merely indicate that Cobb's losing his grip on reality. The not a dream clues could merely reflect Cobb's assumption that he's not dreaming when he really is. Right? The answer to the question of whether or not the entire movie is a dream is what philosophers would call underdetermined. There's not enough evidence there to settle the issue. Right? But this is where philosophy can come to the rescue. Philosophers and scientists know how to deal with underdetermination. For example, uh, any, se any, se any set of scientific data can be accounted for by many possible hypotheses. But we're not just stuck. We have ways of delineating and deciding which ones we should prefer. Scientists prefer the most adequate hypothesis, the one that's most fruitful and simple and wide-scoping and conservative, right? <coughs> Excuse me. This is what we did whenever we were debating about the heliocentric versus geocentric view of the universe, or the solar system at least. Is the sun the center or the earth the center? Well, the earth being the center required all these weird retrogrades and planets revolving around points and blah, 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 and it's really complicated. Where well, this was simple. They all go around the sun. Very simple. And so we ended up selecting after we killed a few people, but apart from that, like, we ended up selecting this even before we could uh, uh, experimentally identify that it was definitely the right one as opposed to this because it was simpler, because it was more adequate, right? And so philosophers, we really can't do that with an in, with interpretation of inception, but and philosophers have more guns in our arsenal. Philosophers, when presented with ambiguity, like ambiguous statements, that kind of stuff, we employ the principle of charity. When it's unclear what someone means, you choose the most charitable interpretation, the one that entails the speaker is not an idiot or not misinformed, right? So which interpretation of Inception is more charitable? Which one makes it a better movie? I think it's the all-dream interpretation that makes it better. And the reason why is because if it's not all a dream, there's some significant criticisms that can be leveled against the movie. For one, all of the characters, except for Cobb, are completely one-dimensional. Arthur, Ariadne, Fisher, Sade, they don't even have last names, much less a past. They're all just there for Cobb. They just do what Cobb wants them to do, right? Even Ariadne, who shows just a little bit of sliver of free will when she eventually, initially rejects the idea of being their architect. I'm out of here, I can't share my subconscious with somebody like you, and she walks out. Cobb just says, oh, she'll be back. 
And then what does she do? Next thing, she comes back, right? They're completely one-dimensional. They're only there for Cobb. That's not good writing, and Nolan doesn't usually do one-dimensional characters. Even, like, you know, uh, 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 somebody give me Batman's, uh, 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 Batman's, uh, his butler. Alfred. Alfred, right? Even Alfred's got a past, and he's a complicated character in Batman, right? That's not Nolan's style. The editing in the real world is sloppy. There's kind of quick jumps from here to there, and you're not, you're not quite sure how you got from here to there, and why are we doing this now? And there's all these really weird jumps in the real world in regards to just mere editing. And that chase scene in Mombasa, and he's got all the agents on him, and then Sato shows up out of nowhere. What are you doing in Mombasa? I had to protect my investment. Really? That's a little cheesy, right? That's not exactly the best way out of that situation, right? But if it's all a dream, the characters are one-dimensional because they're just projections of Cobb's subconscious, right? They each represent a different aspect of Cobb. And if you watch the movie with that in mind, you'll see that each one of them plays a different role in his subconscious. One's the planner, one's more daring, right? One's the moral conscious. You could even divide it into like id, id, uh, ego and superego, right? I mean, you, you see all of these elements. Um, the sloppy editing, well, we see that same sloppy editing when we know that Cobb is dreaming. You jump from place to place to place in a dream, not realizing where, how you got there, because that's what you do in dreams. He's doing the same thing in the real world, jumping from place to place to place. And yeah, that Sato line is a little bit cheesy, I have to protect my investment, but as a subtle clue that Cobb is actually dreaming, that is brilliant, right? A much more charitable interpretation. Now, you might think that it's not too charitable, because if the whole movie's a dream, well, then why would you care? Why would, I want to, why would I want to watch a movie about a dream, right? It's not, nothing's really happening, right? So I don't really care. Well, that's the thing. It's a movie. It's fiction. Yeah, it doesn't really happen because it's a dream. It doesn't happen anyway. It's a movie, right? Why would you care more about a movie about a dream than about a movie about a fictional movie about events that didn't happen anyway? They all didn't happen. Right? This is the paradox of fiction that Tyler was talking about a while ago, right? How do, why do we care about events that we don't know are happening? Well, I'm not exactly sure how to solve that paradox, but I know that the paradox arises whether or not the movie's about a dream or not, right? And so it doesn't make it a worse movie. In fact, it kind of makes it pretty cool because it could be a metaphorical story about how a disturbed mind handles its own dementia. I mean, there's all kinds of cool interpretations that could go with it. I think that are really, really interesting, right? Now you might wonder, we could solve all this if we just ask Nolan himself. <laughs> is the whole movie a dream or not? And Nolan's even said that he does have a view, like yeah, I, I approached it with a certain kind of interpretation in mind, and I kind of know what I think is real and what's not. But does that matter? Does Nolan get to dictate how his film must be interpreted? Or if he makes it ambiguous, is it open to us? If he wanted to be interpreted a certain way, he had to put in there something to make it be interpreted that way. And if he doesn't do that, if he intentionally makes it ambiguous, then my interpretation is just as valid as his. Is that the way, is that the way art works? Or does a thorough intention matter? Right? That's what the first chapter of my book is about. It raises this issue about whether or not the entire movie is a dream, and then talks about whether or not the authorial intention view is correct. Right? Inception should have won best picture. Either the Academy didn't understand it, or they didn't interpret it charitably. If they had done either, they would have realized that it was much better than a film about a stuttering English monarch. Clearly a better film, right? But even though it didn't win Best Picture, Inception still wins Plato's Academy Award, it looks like Rodin's Thinker, because of its philosophical depth because of the plethora of philosophical questions that it raises, and then of course I tackle in my book, Inception and Philosophy, because it's never just a dream, uh, published by Wiley Blackwell. So some of the other, not all of them, but some of the other topics that we cover in the book, if we can't tell whether or not Cobb is dreaming, can we tell whether we're dreaming right now? Could this be a dream? Can you be certain? The answer is no, you can't. Right? This is a classic philosophical skeptical problem. And once we realize we can't tell for sure whether the real world is real, how do we deal with that angst? How do we deal with the kind of tension, the kind of mental anguish that causes us? Right? Coleman's got a chapter about that. Perhaps we should just have faith that the world is real. Maybe that's a way out of it. All right. But when is faith rational? Is faith ever right? Faith is belief without evidence. 
that's a lot of times that's not rational, right? I, I could believe without evidence that there's an elephant behind me, but that's not rational, right? When is faith, if ever, rational? Cobb doesn't think it's always rational. Maul asked him to take a leap of faith out right out window, and he refused, right? So when is it rational to take a leap of faith, if ever? That's what my chapter is about. Um, can you be held morally responsible for what you do in your dreams? You might think they don't have real world impact, but what if you thought it was real? Don't sometimes your intentions matter? If you thought it was real and you had that chance to cheat on your significant other in your dream and you did it, aren't you a bit morally culpable? Wouldn't they be upset if they found out that's what you did in your dream? Right? That's another good chapter. Um, are real paradoxes, like the Penrose Steps, possible? That's Tyler's chapter. Um, is inception really possible? Isn't that, for example, what advertisements do? And if it is possible, what are the kind of ethics that go along with that? And does that threaten free will? We don't think that Fisher gets moral responsibility. He doesn't freely choose to break up his father's company. But if inception happens all the time in the real world, are we morally responsible for what we do? Do I really freely choose to eat that McDonald's hamburger when I'm bombarded with advertisements all the time that make me want a McDonald's hamburger? What is time? What exactly is time? And can it really slow down in a dream or speed up in a dream? Would you really want to live in limbo, a utopia, a perfect world? Or would you eventually get bored with that? Is ut are utopias even possible? Those are all issues that I talk about, uh, that, that I and my authors, of course, uh, my contributors talk about uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the book. So that's my presentation. And I thank you so much. I'm ready for uh, questions. I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, I'm just curious, you, you, know, you mentioned Freudian psychology, or it sounded more Freudian, but um, I have a writing teacher who really got enthralled with it. Uh, he has a, actually has a really good blog, his name is Scott Myers, and he, he, got, um, he was talking about it from a Jungian perspective, which with the dream interpretation, and you know, it seems to lend itself a lot to, to that. I'm just wondering if you get into that in your book at all? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, I'm not familiar with it at all, so I wish I wish I would have known about it so I could. But I well, yeah. Well, you might just out of you know since you're so into this, you might you might look into some some union stuff. I can give you a list of books. Uh, right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. No, we do for the recording. Trust me. Um, I was wondering if you had a link to the PowerPoint presentation at um, all. I'm sure anywhere. we can do that. I could, um, I'll tell you what, when I get home, I will post it on my website. So just Google David Kyle Johnson. My webpage for King's College will pop up and you can download it there. Um, Cliff, can we make it available somehow yeah, through? Yeah, it'll be on the footage. Yeah. Okay, okay yeah. awesome. Yeah, I'm hoping that I kind of like almost bombarded you a bit. And really, almost everything I covered in there is in here, right? So. So how many times did you have to watch the movie to get all this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, uh, quite a few times. Um, I also you know, took to just watching specific parts as I was editing the book and seeing what I needed to see. Um, a, a, a number of other things were also like, here's I think a really kind of fun, cool part of the book. Um, and this, so if you add up all the, all the times that all my contributors and I watched the movie, it's got to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And one of the ways I took advantage of that was I created a Google Doc, all right? Google Docs are so cool. And I gave a link to every one of my contributors and I started a little uh, uh, appendix of cool things that you might have missed about the film. And I let all my contributors just dump stuff on there. And after they were done, I went through and edited it. And so the end of the book is an appendix that is a result of like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of watchings of the movie that have all these cool little things that you may have missed upon the first watching of the film. Right? So uh, off the top of my head, a kind of cool one is the fact that uh, Dom, um, oh, one second. Dom, Robert, Eames, Arthur, Maul, Sado, put them in the right order, they spell dreams. You know, those, those, kind of, those kind of cool things, right? Um, to uh, the, the stuff about Inception being analogy, about uh, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. We even have like a catalog of exactly what those two kids were wearing in before and after the, at the end of the movie and in the video to see exactly how different their outfits were. It's very, very detailed, but that's in the appendix. Go here in the one. 
Uh, so about the kids, um, you didn't mention this specifically, but I suspect you probably did turn it up that uh, you never see the kids' faces until right. the end. Until the so end. So I, I don't know what the significance of that might yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, th that could be a clue that he's really awake. It could be just a clue that he, he thinks he's really gotten back home and so he can finally see his kids' faces at the end. So it may not, I mean, it could be a clue either way. Right? Well, so the other, the other uh, probably more uh, deeper question that I had is, um, uh, I read uh, that, that clue about the wedding ring mm -hmm. uh, months ago. I don't know if you read The Last Psychiatrist. I don't think uh, so. It's a great blog. Uh, it's worth checking out. But uh, he did a thing in there where he mentioned it. And so I was talking this over with a bunch of friends, and one of them had watched the movie again. And uh, his, his claim, uh, the way he kind of interpreted that, was that Cobb actually destroyed his totem in the real world because he knew it so well, he didn't need to actually have it present. He only knew that if it behaved the way he didn't expect it in the dream, then he was in someone else's dream. And there was no reason to actually have it. And the whole thing about having Mal's totem was just in remembrance of her and wasn't actually his totem. Interesting. So he doesn't have a totem at all. So his wedding ring is not even his totem? Or his wedding ring is the his totem? His we wedding ring he destroys was, it in the real world. He doesn't need it right. because he knows how it behaves and he doesn't want anyone else to right. discover it is right. kind of one way of, in, of interpreting that. Right. Um, and I don't know if that's actually... I don't know if that affects anything you've said, actually. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it still doesn't like it still doesn't cause it still doesn't solve the problem that he can still be in his own dream. Yeah, but right? it's an interesting thing. That yeah, I absolutely you interesting. Might be interesting. Yeah. Did you circle back with Christopher Christopher Nolan to validate any of your um, observations? Uh, no, I haven't. I wish I could. I'd love to sit down and talk with Christopher Nolan. Um, I wasn't able to do that. We we did uh, you know scope through his interviews and that kind of stuff to see what what he said right. So, like, one thing I know that, and of course this, this raises the issue of whether or not an Arthur can determine the meaning of his movie or not, but one thing I know is like one other kind of dream clue is the fact that the, the company that's after Cobb is Cobol. C-O-B-O-L, Cobol, Cobb, Cobol, he's after himself? Like, that really looks, right? And Nolan himself said, oh, yeah, that's just a coincidence. I had to change the name of that company multiple times for legal reasons, so it looks like that's just a coincidence, not really a clue. Right? But again, maybe it could still serve as a clue if the author doesn't get to determine the absolute meaning of his film. Right? Uh, but I, I wish, if you've got some contacts, let me know, and I'd love to sit down and talk with you. Your last question. So do you think the, the fact that Mel's uh, uh, Mal and Edith Piaf was both played by Marion Cotillard was also a clue? I don't think it was a clue. Nolan actually talked about that as well. And he basically said something like, uh, don't read too much into it. It's kind of a cool thing, right? But don't read too much into it. It's not like a... But yeah, that is the, the, the actress who plays Maul also plays Edith Piaf in the movie about her life. Right? It's the same actress, which is pretty cool. All right, cool. Well, we will have some time afterwards for more specific Inception and Dragon Tattoo questions. Thank you very much for speaking right, at Google. Steph.